Hello. Today we're going to discuss the Silk Road. Our thesis on the subject is, the establishment of the Silk Road, a transregional commercial route, created an international system, as can be seen following the criteria established for international systems by Buzan and Little due to its scale, pattern, units, interaction, processes, and structure. We will try to answer our thesis by introducing the Silk Road, then defining what an international system is, and seeing if the characteristics of our definition match the characteristics of the Silk Road. According to Hinru Liu, author of The Silk Road in World History, the Silk Road was a system of commercial routes on both land and sea that linked various people from China to the Mediterranean. As you can see, this was the scope of the Silk Road. Some of the examples of highly relevant products on the Silk Road were war horses, species, fragrances, wine, precious stones like lapis lazuli, gold, silverware, and glassware, and of course, silk yarn and fabrics. We can establish the chronological order of the Silk Road in the following way. Pre-commerce, emergence, golden age, and decline. During the Qin Dynasty from 221 BCE until 207 BCE, we can find the first exchanges of silk, not as a means of trade, but as a diplomatic tool to solve regional conflicts as it was considered a luxury product. But it wouldn't be until the Han Dynasty around the years 206 BCE till 220 CE that the transregional commercial routes were established as such. The markets and products of the Han, Kushan, Parthian, and Roman empires may have created the Silk Road, but the trade and the cultural exchanges that resulted did not reach full in maturity and splendor until after these empires had collapsed. Like many of their steppe predecessors, Mongols of the 13th century destroyed almost all the facilities along the trade routes during their initial conquest. Furthermore, they subsequently became patrons of trade and sponsors of religious activities all along the routes that passed through the lands they conquered, facilitating then commercial and cultural exchanges on the Eurasian land routes. What happened after that? In the 14th century, famines and flood devastated the people of China. Such conditions built rebellions and one of the rebel leaders defeated the Yang dynasty of the Mongol Empire and successfully established a new Chinese empire, the Ming. This one abandoned the caravan towns and religious facilities in Central Asia that had depended on the overland traffic decline. Many of them were gradually covered by desert sand and disappeared from the landscape forever. Another factor that contributed to the decline of the Silk Road undoubtedly was the growing sea trade that would replace land trade since it was considered to be more effective and farther reaching. There is not a universally accepted definition of what constitutes an international system, and the fact that they have existed for a very wide historical range makes it even more difficult to establish a definition. However, and for the purpose of this task, we are going to use the definition provided by Hadley Bull and Adam Watson in The Expansion of International Society, according to which an international system is a group of states, or more generally, a group of independent political communities, which not merely form a system in the sense that the behavior of each is necessary factor in the calculation of the others, but also have established by dialogue and consent common rules and institutions for the conduct of their relations and recognize their common interest in maintaining this arrangement. The following questions need to be asked about any international system. What is the scale of the system? Is its pattern linear or multi-ordinate? What kinds of units dominate the system? Is its interaction capacity high or low? What types of processes define the system? What types of structures does the system possess? And how do units and structures interact with each other? Does the Silk Road meet the established criteria? What is the scale of the system? The Silk Road became the main communication and transportation artery of Eurasia. It stretched from the Han capital, Chang'an, to Antioch and the Mediterranean and onwards by the sea to Rome. Later, it also extended eastwards to Japan. The Islamic silk trade began with the first Islamic empire, the Umayyad Caliphate, 
and by the 10th century, Islamic trading networks had extended across most of Eurasia, North Africa, and Africa's eastern coast, and some locations in West Africa. Is its pattern linear or multi-ordinate? The Silk Road is the classical example of a linear structure. Proof of this is that although many regions were involved in the trade of Chinese silk, such as Africa, the Middle East, India, Indonesia, and Central Asia, it is unlikely that these regions were all aware of one another as consumers of Chinese silk. Before the establishment of the Silk Road and the creation of an international economic system, in Eurasia there were fully fledged international systems where all sectors were represented, including political and military. The Silk Road connected following a linear pattern, fully international systems where all sectors were represented across Eurasia. This way, it managed to create an international economic system. What kind of units dominate the system? There are five basic units, hunter-gatherer bands, tribes, city-states, empires, and modern states, taking into account that the Silk Road lasted for 17 centuries. Moreover, we can also include specialized units such as merchants, guilds, and trade diasporas through banks and some chartered companies. Is its interaction capacity high or low? The interaction capacity in the Silk Road was high, especially during the Tang Dynasty, in which foreign trade expanded to a point never reached before, and goods from China were to be found in market towns throughout Near and Middle East. The high interaction can be seen in the spreading of religious ideas as well as in art and culture. Buddhism started in India, but from the 3rd to the 9th century, it became one of the three main religions in China. Chang'an in Shenzi was, in the 7th and 8th centuries, the greatest city of the world. The streets were filled with the cosmopolitan populace befitting the capital of such an extensive empire. The artwork of the cushions is the perfect example of how they incorporated the Greek, Roman, and Indian traditions onto their own. As a meeting place for peoples of multiple nationalities, the Silk Road was a site of sustained language exchange in an era long before the development of modern learning aids like dictionaries and textbooks. During the 10th and 14th centuries, considered the decline of the Silk Road, silk was transported less but was an important medium of exchange, a symbol of the power balances between China and other regions. What types of processes define the system? The Silk Road was defined by three different types of processes, economic, societal, and environmental. Economically, its biggest breakthrough occurred during the first millennium BCE, when the eastern, southern, and western Eurasian trading systems linked up to form a single Eurasian trading system, moving goats between all of its four centers of civilization, China, India, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean. At the height of this trade, records suggest that 120 ships per year carried goods between Rome via Egypt and India. Socially speaking, the Silk Road gave way to Buddhism reaching China from India around 120 BC by means of both merchants and missionaries along the caravan routes through Central Asia into China. For half a millennium after the fall of the Han Dynasty, Buddhism became firmly implanted in China. Later, after the establishment of Islam, Bentley argues that the volume of Eurasian international trade far outstripped the amount that circulated when the Silk Road was first established. During this period, the tempo of cross-cultural contacts increased dramatically. Christianity extended into Northern Europe, Buddhism came to flourish in China as well as Southeast and Central Asia, and at the same time, Islam expanded into North Africa and across Asia. The Eurasian system acted as an important transmission belt for technologies and ideas, and played a major role in the spread of Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. Movements along the Silk Road consisted mainly of pilgrimage and commerce, and the trades in silk going westwards and Buddhist relics eastwards became intertwined. The environmental process was important in the movement of flora and fauna along the Silk Road, as well as the spread of diseases. An example of this would be the movement of the two humped camels, larger animals that walk more slowly than horses, but in arid regions, they can endure much harsher conditions than horses can, and they can go without water and good pasture for much longer. Furthermore, from the 2nd century BCE, the Chinese and Roman empires were weakened as waves of diseases spread across Eurasia, causing huge population die-offs. For instance, 
the establishment of bubonic plague in the rodent population of the Eurasian steppe during the Mongol Empire played a role in the decline of barbarian power that accompanied the end of this era. Similarly to the different processes of the Silk Road, they also had different structures within themselves, being both economic and societal. The economic structure is perhaps the most clear, since the Silk Road was a diverse system of trade routes. Market forces were clearly at work in impelling the movement of various goods across the vast distances of Eurasia. Indeed, no polity existed on anything like the scale necessary to impose command over that trade. And yet it seems risky to characterize the structure of the Eurasia, or any other trading system of this era, as a market. The trade was certainly moved by comparative advantage, and market forces did generate some specialization. There are also different types of international systems operating throughout this era. Larger but rather tenuous economic systems defined principally by patterns of war, diplomacy, and security dilemma. In Eurasia, the economic system expanded until it embraced all of the full international systems. Socially speaking, the Silk Road highlighted the cases like the relationship between classical Greece and the Persian Empire, where two culturally distinct international societies formed a meta-international society. During this era, there are several distinct full international systems operating at the same time, and over the course of the era, all of these systems tended to expand, sometimes merging with each other in the process. How do units and structures interact with each other? Caravan cities were created along the trade routes such as Petra. Camels were useful to go through desert zones as opposed to horses. Buddhist institutions provided the infrastructure along the Eastern Eurasia section of the Silk Road. This was also done by the Islamic rulers, who established institutions in all major trade routes, even in places where Islam was not dominant. Chinese became the language of cross-cultural communication along the Great Wall, but also outside because of the settlements in other areas. But when the Han and Roman empires collapsed, Sogdian became one of the main commercial languages used among traders in Central Asia. After seeing all that, can we say that the establishment of the Silk Road, a transregional commercial route, created an international system as can be seen following the criteria established for international systems by Busan and Little due to its scale, pattern, unit, interaction, processes, and structure? We have seen along the explanation that in relation with the definition of international system, the Silk Road indeed generated a network that shaped behaviors through the establishment of dialogue and common rules for the interest of all regions taking part of the process, especially economic interests. We have agreed that in order to identify if the Silk Road generated what Busan and Little considered as an international system, we should be able to answer certain questions. The Silk Road connected Japan, China, Central Asia, India, the Middle East, West Africa, and Europe. It presented a linear pattern. The units that dominated the system were hunter-gatherer bands, tribes, city-states, empires, and modern states. High interaction capacity could be seen in the expansion of foreign trade and cultural legacy. The processes that dominated the system were economic, societal, and environmental. The Silk Road had an economic and societal structure, and units and structures interact through caravans, camels, institutions, and language. As we have been able to meet all the criteria formulated for any international system, we conclude that the Silk Road was, indeed, an international system.